Good evening, dear listeners, dear Mr. Kastev. With today's lecture, we are opening the series on the theme of envisioning Europe. In the context of the conference on the future of Europe, the House of European History is inviting politicians, historians, uh, political scientists and other thinkers to debate their views on Europe, its past, present and future. Our guests will come from all parts of Europe, from Africa, Asia and America. We are broadcasting today from the sixth floor of the House of European History's uh, permanent exhibition. The sixth floor, which uh, as you see here, I'm surrounded by objects, could be called a connector. A connector between uh, past, present and future, and a connector between Europe and uh, between the museum and different places in Europe through all the interactive stations that we have here. Paul Valéry said that history can serve to multiply ideas. Our exhibition shows that history is the result of a lot of ideas, many of them, however, with disastrous consequences, as European history is a history of centuries of wars. However, our exhibition also displays an abundance of visions for Europe's future, all of which derive from their specific context and from their times. Visions for Europe depend on the eye of the beholder, on their geographical, social, political and personal standpoint, as well as on the moment in time from which they, they, the persons view the continent. As there is neither a definition nor an essence of what Europe is and should be, Europe's reality has always been influenced by the ways in which Europeans saw it, and therefore representations of Europe have contributed to shaping its reality, a reality that has been constantly changing. Some of these ideas were realized around the time of their inventions, others much later, and others again have never been realized. For example, ideas of European Federation were suggested as early as 1462 by the Bohemian King, or in 1640 by Duc de Sully. A kind of European Parliament was proposed as early as 1693 by William Penn. A common European currency was proposed numerous times from the mid-19th century onwards. The idea of a European army was already in circulation in the 17th century. The House of European History's permanent exhibition, because of its focus on 19th and 20th century history, displays more recent ideas about Europe. For example, Victor Hugo, who suggested the United States of Europe to a Paris Peace Congress in 1849. The Pan-Europa movement, which suggested a Pan-European Union. Or, against the background of World War II, the 45 different concepts of Europe which were put in, in writing by resistance movements and describing the creation of a supranational authority, a common market, a common currency, or the freedom of movement. Amidst the wealth of post-war visions for Europe, uh, and with the aim of preventing further wars, sexual integration prevailed, with the creation of a European community for coal and steel, Euratom, and the European Economic Community, integrating important industries and creating a common market. European integration advanced through progress and setbacks, having an increasing impact on people's lives and accomplishing on the way many of the old ideas for further integration, such as the common currency. Others, such as the joint army, have never been realized. Today, the European Union is more integrated, but also more diverse than ever before, and is faced with global challenges that require courageous ideas. Against the background, therefore, of five centuries of ideas about Europe, we are inviting today's thinkers to tell us more about their vision of Europe. How should Europe develop in a world which is more in interconnected than ever? How strong should the Union be in European Union? Can post-colonial Europe address its past with courage and compassion? How should the pressing issues of climate change and of inequality be addressed? How should Europe welcome those who want to immigrate so as to become Europeans? What traces will the pandemic year leave on Europe. The Envisioning Europe lecture series will be opened tonight by Ivan Krastev, Chair of the Center for Liberal Studies in Sofia, 
and permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Ivan is the founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations and a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group. He's the author of best-selling books such as Democracy Disrupted, Can Democracy Survive? Another question. After Europe, The Light That Failed a Reckoning, and Is It Tomorrow Yet? How the Pandemic Changes Europe. Ivan Krastev is the winner of the Jean Améry Prize for European Essay Writing 2020. Ivan, in last year's book, you described seven paradoxes related to the pandemic situation. For example, re related to globalization, national coherence, the fate of liberal democracies, or the future of the European Union. These paradoxes seem to indicate that we stand at a crossroads with an absolute uncertain outcome. I've heard you quoting an American proverb saying, it's very hard to predict, especially the future. And since you've written this book, I would like to ask, do you see more certainty about how Europe could and should develop? Is it tomorrow yet? Over to you. Thank you very much. And there is no better place to talk about the future than in the house of European history, because normally, our talks about the future are reflections on the past. Nevertheless, do we acknowledge it or not? And listen, talking about the future is also not easy. This is slightly like giving a lecture when you don't see your audience. So you are never sure what you are saying and how people are going to react. But uh, when I was going today through the exhibition of the museum, I was very much struck by something. You have a very impressive uh, exposition of Europe and how it was shaped by the World War I, by World War II, you're going to see nothing about the Spanish flu. There were more, more people who died because of the Spanish flu than in the World War I or World War II. And then the question comes, are we going to remember the pandemic as a collective experience? How this is going to shape Europe? How it's going to shape the world? I'm saying this because in 2003, one of the cultural icons of Europe, the American-French uh, public intellectual George Steiner, gave a lecture in Amsterdam and he was talking about his idea of Europe. And according to him, Europe has five major characteristics. He said, Europe is a place of coffee houses and cafes where newspapers are for free and people can read them and they can comment and they can gossip and then can conspire. So both Bolshevism and Dadaism has been born in a cafe. And then he said, Europe is a pedestrian space, particularly compared to his, the United States. The relations of the Europeans to the space is very different. We are walking our streets. We are very much there. We are not in the cars. And thirdly, he said, Europe is a place where squares and streets, he has the names of poets, of scientists, of statements. So people are just learning history by reading the city map. And you have these two different sources of intellectual Europe. You have Jerusalem and Athens together. But the fifth and important things that uh, uh, Steiner talked about the European worldview and Europeans understanding of the world was that Europeans much more than the Americans were very much aware of the fragility of history, of the fact that th things can turn wrong. Uh, they have been always living with the idea of an end. I'm saying this because George Steiner died February last year. He was 90 years old. He died in the very moment in which the coronavirus starts spreading in Europe. So probably he was lucky that he didn't see in a at least for a moment, that Europe that he so much cherished that has disappeared. Because during this light, the last 18 months, of course, the coffee shops have been closed. There were not many people walking on the streets. The squares have been empty. And even when you talk to the younger generation, uh, I'm not sure that many of them knows the names of the poets and scientists on whose names uh, these streets have been named. But what was very much present uh, during these 18 months is that Europeans, more than ever, particularly in the last 50 years, have been faced exactly with the fragility of the world, with the uncertainty that we have been talking about. 
Uh, and then the question is how this is going to shape European Union, how this is going to change Europe. If you go to the opinion polls, you're going to see that initially the crisis very much consolidated sense of Europe. Paradoxically, the moment when Europeans close their borders, we had the feeling that you're living in a common Europe much stronger than before. We all the time were comparing what is happening in our country with what is happening next door. We basically discovered how eager we are to cross borders. By the way, for younger generation, they discovered that borders between the EU member states exist. They have not known this before. But also we discovered that many things that we have been taken for granted were not as easy uh, to realize. For example, we discovered that uh, in responding to this crisis, the difference between democracies and authoritarian regimes were not so clearly done. In many places, basically, you are not going to predict on the basis of what kind of policy have been adopted, what is a democracy and what is authoritarian regimes. There was democracy that did well, but there were democracies that didn't do well in responding to the crisis. So all these questions started to come. And uh, while people were talking a lot about how this was the moment of technology, that on a daily basis we have been crossing the border between the physical world and the virtual world, from time to time, basically, because I can imagine, like you, we have been all over Zoomed. And I had the feeling that uh, our conferences and seminars very much reminded me of these spiritual, spiritual sessions that I have seen uh, my grandmothers being involved in, which is you're talking to something transcendental, and the connection is always broken. And in a certain way, you're not very much clear what is going on anyway. Uh, but while well, technology was very much on the top of the agenda and people see how much it is changing our lives. Well, there was a lot of uh, talk about what we can learn because of the pandemic uh, when we think about climate and particularly, I do believe it was striking for many people to understand how little cooperation we have, particularly in the beginning. And nevertheless, that uh, the pandemic was a common problem, global problem. So why we, the states were so unable to cooperate. But I'll try to stress something that in my view have been less discussed, but at least in my view, is going to be critical for the future of Europe and particularly for the future of European democracies. So the major argument of my talk is that paradoxically, pandemic was Europe's demographic moment. Overnight, we all were reminded how young or old we are. All these professionals talking about 60 being the new 40s didn't work so well in the days of the pandemic, suddenly we realize how vulnerable we are, but also what is the demographic structure of our societies. Listen, demographers have been always known that our societies are aging and shrinking, that there is not uh, uh, many young people, but normally people don't think in these terms. And then suddenly, because of the pandemic, we realize how many people older than 80s are living in our societies. By the way, we discovered that many of them are living in old people nurses' houses. And then we discovered how they live, because there was a moment, at least in the beginning, in which many of us have been living like our parents, I mean older parents, in which we are staying in our apartments, we were not getting out, as if nothing much is happening in our life. And I do believe this kind of intense sense of age, of fragility, of demography became critically important because it is not simply that we learn the demographies of our societies and the demographies of the world, but also what we learned strangely enough is to think with projections, to live with mathematical models. For the first time we started to understand what is exponential growth. We realized that if today, as one a colleague uh, beautifully expressed it, uh, there is a lake that is totally covered by lily flowers. If it was the result of the exponential growth just yesterday, only half of the lake was going to be full of lily flowers. So all this very much, in my view, changed the idea of uh, uh, demography. And because also, suddenly, the movement of people have been frozen, this allows us to see migration in a totally different way. Paradoxically, it was the pandemic that closed much more borders than Europe than the refugee crisis of 2015 and 2016. 
But the moment when the borders were closed, we realized basically to what extent our societies very much depend on people who are crossing the borders between European states on a daily basis. We realized many kind of the limits of uh, particularly economic nationalism. But, and this is going to be critical for, uh, uh, for the message that I will try uh, 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 to send today, we also understand something very simple. There are not enough young people in Europe. That there is a major generational disbalance. And this generational disbalance probably is going to have an important social, economic, and political consequences. Because the young people, at least, at least in the beginning, look less vulnerable uh, when uh, basically the pandemic started. But with the passing of time, we realized that it was their lifestyle that was changed most. It was their educational experience that have been very much transformed. This is the economic opportunities that are going to be very much challenged by the policies that are taken uh, today. And secondly, the problem is how they're going to live in a world in which we all talk about change. But the paradox of the pandemic is that now when at least we can hope that after the vaccination, the worst part of this is over, our societies are very much infected with nostalgia. Now when people talk about change, the change that we're talking about is return to the world in the way it was before the pandemic. And this is not necessarily the world these young people are really interested to live in. And I think that this is critically important. And I do believe this is going to affect very much the way our democracies function. We tend to talk about when the government change in a democratic country, we normally talk that this is because people change their mind. But government can change also because the population changes. When a bigger generation entered, what happened in Western Europe in 60s and 70s, this was a major political change. When basically unification of Germany happened and basically the German body politics uh, has been changed, this was a major change. When a lot of young East Europeans uh, emigrated uh, in the last 10, 15 years, this was also a political change that was not the result of the fact that people changed their mind, but the body politics changes. And I'm saying this because uh, normally demography and democracy have been discussed, and everybody knows that in a democracy it's very important to be majority and everybody is afraid of being outvoted. But in the moment of an important demographic crisis in which what we're talking about and what we're experiencing is the fear of depopulation, the fear of the fact that European societies are aging and shrinking. I do believe we should try to look in a different way of these relations between politics and, uh, 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 and demography. And from this point of view, what is happening in the United States is a very important signal about certain changes that we can see. Uh, and uh, uh, at least for me, uh, probably the best way to try to change the perspective and to see what is going on is to remind, remember an old uh, poem written by Brecht in a totally different context. It was 1953. There was the anti-communist riots in East Germany. Uh, there was official declaration of uh, the German intellectuals that the workers were not kind of deserving. Uh, the confidence of, uh, uh, of the party and the government, and then Brecht in a very satirical way and sardonically said, if the government is so much displeased with the people, why they decide to dissolve the people and to elect a new one? I'm saying this because, of course, probably Brecht uh, have noticed that in a democracy, it is always that people elect the governments, but governments also elect the people. And the government select the people by designing a citizenship laws. Governments dis elect the people by designing electoral laws on the basis of who is going to be allowed to vote and who is not going to be allowed to vote. You're going to have a totally different idea of politics and who is going to be elected. And I'm saying this because we are living in a moment in which we are going to see a lot of demographic change. And now when people are talking in Europe about the clash between liberalism and illiberalism, this is my feeling is that what liberals and illiberals principally disagree about is what kind of people they want to elect. And let's give you an example. 
about this disagreement. Uh, in one of the wealthy outskirts of Vienna, uh, there is a nice restaurant where uh, uh, a journalist colleagues once invited me. It is an Italian restaurant, and it was founded probably 78 years ago by an Italian, but then it was bought by an Egyptian, and all the waiters and cooks are non-Italians. You have Bosniaks, Serbs, probably Bulgarians, but nobody of the people working in this restaurant, know the owner, uh, know the cook, know the waiters, have ever been to Italy. They don't know a word of Italian. But the menu is Italian, the wine is Italian, the music is Italian, and the question is, is this an Italian restaurant? If you're going basically to ask uh, a liberal in Europe today, he's going to say yes, because it is the menu that matters. It is the constitution. It is basically what you are going to be served. You're going to ask many East Europeans, they're going to say, but could be an Italian restaurant, a restaurant in which Italians do not feel at home? How is it going to happen? Is this Italian going to the restaurant and nobody can speak his language? Uh, so this tension between uh, the classical uh, ethnic definition of the nation and the constitutional definition of the nation can be seen much stronger now when we can decide to open or not to open our body politics. And here is a certain type of a optical uh, illusion when it comes uh, to Central and Eastern Europe. People believe that Central and East European societies are very much closed for foreigners because this is the impression that East Europeans created during the uh, migration crisis being very kind of hostile to the idea of any foreigners coming. But then you're looking at uh, the actual data and you're going to be surprised to know that before the pandemics, the European Union member states that basically welcomed the highest number of foreigners to work is, was Poland. Almost two million people, mostly Ukrainians, but also Pakistanis. It was interesting to see how the Polish government was fighting to get 10,000 millions, uh, 10,000 Syrians uh, claiming that they don't want Muslims. But you have 20 or 30,000 Pakistanis working in the country. I, to the, at least to my knowledge, Pakistanis are Muslims too. So in a certain way, it is not about foreigners coming and working in our countries. This is very much, do you want them? to be part of your society? Do you want to give them political rights? Or are you going to treat them as a guest workers in the way, by the way, many Turks, East Europeans, Portuguese have been treated in Western Europe, for example, in Germany in the 1960s and 1970s. I'm saying this because this is going to be one of the critical things that is happening. And this is going to be critically important to see how European Union is going to balance, in my view, the major clash that we see these days. And this is the two different ideas of majority that historically we have. One is the idea of majority in the way it came from the nation state. And in the nation states, majorities and minorities are permanent. And majorities are tolerating minorities to the extent that they are non-threatening. And uh, my colleague, Timothy Snyder, in my view, make a very strong uh, argument when he claims that the model European nation states were not France or Germany or Britain at the end of the 19th century because all of them have been in empires. The model nation states have been Serbia and Greece. It was the Balkan nation states who basically created the model which after that starts to spread and you have these anti-colonial nation states that came after the disintegration of the colonial empire, the Ottoman, the Habsburgs, uh, the Germans uh, 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 and the Russian after the World War I. I'm saying this because this idea of a permanent minority, uh, majority, majority that is very much defined in a national ethnic term is something that is very much part of the experience particularly of Central and East Europeans. If empire was the major form of political organization in the west of Europe, in the east of Europe, it was very much the anti-colonial nation states which were very much defining themselves in ethnic terms. And this was critically important because uh, if you're going to see what happened uh, in the 20th century to Central and Eastern Europe, you're going to see that the most important thing that happened was a process of ethnic homogenization. In 20th century, people travel, 
but states travel too. Uh, it's a well-known the story of one Macedonian peasant who never ever left his village. He was born in the beginning of 20th century. He died at the beginning of 20th century. As I told, he never left his village, but he managed to be a subject of five different countries, of five different states. So states have been traveling and people have been traveling too. And as a result of the revolutions and the wars, as the result of the ethnic cleansing, uh, at uh, the end of the Cold War, Central and Eastern Europe was much more ethnically homogeneous than it was at the end of the 19th century and also much more ethnically homogeneous than Western Europe. This is the irony of history. In the beginning of 20th century, there were two Europes. One was slightly more ethnically homogeneous and it was Western Europe, France, Germany, Scandinavian countries. The other was very much ethnically and culturally diverse and this was Central Europe. But the story is that this idea of ethnic and cultural diversity have been conceptualized by the newly born nation states as a security threat. The idea of having a minority was a problem and it was a problem because when uh, this type of a continental empires uh, were dissolved and when 90 million people basically were coming and becoming part of a different new states, 30 million of these 90 billion were with the status of a minority in one country and not. And I'm saying this because we have been telling the story, particularly of the last 30 years, particularly the story of Europe after the end of the Cold War, very much seen from places like Budapest, like Warsaw, like Prague, what happened, democratization. Nevertheless, which is positive or negative, but this was the paradigm. And everything that happened in the former Yugoslavia was perceived as kind of a deviation as if basically what happened in former Yugoslavia was the past and what we are seeing in the Central and Eastern Europe was the future. Now when you see many of the problems that I'm talking about, obsession with demography, obsession of the fact that I want you to be minority in my country and not you, I to be minority in yours, it can turn out that basically the Yugoslav experience can help us better understand some of the problems Europe is facing today. I'm saying this because the biggest problem for anybody today who is trying to define the political community in ethnic terms, paradoxically is going to be the generational disbalance. When some of the Central and East European governments today believe that they can preserve the ethnic nature of their body politics, the thing that they should be afraid of is that the new minority is going to appear in our countries and this minority is going to be the young people. And these young people, they don't have the numbers. Many of them are very, the first one who decide that if they don't like what they see now in their country, it's easier to change the country than to change the government. And this kind of out migration of young people is very much shaping the politics on the periphery of the European Union. And I'm saying this because from this point of view, the COVID-19 was also a kind of an opportunity because this was the first crisis after 1989 in which we see the reverse of the movement of people from the east to the west. There was a movement of people from the west to the east. 200,000 Bulgarians came back because of the crisis. We don't know how they're going to stay. They're going to decide this on the base. Do they like what they see in their own countries? What kind of economic opportunities they have? But not only in uh, 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 Central and Eastern Europe, in generally in Europe, we have a generation which is the best educated generation in the history of Europe, but at the same time, there are small numbers. And this is why we should not be surprised to see that when you go on the opinion polls, you're going to see the dissatisfaction of democracy is highest exactly among this generation. This is the generation that is not extremely eager to vote on the regional elections in France, which took part just uh, two days, uh, uh, one day ago, 83% uh, of the youngest French voters did not vote. This is a real issue. And I'm saying this because uh, thinking in the terms of the intergenerational politics in European Union and how this is going to affect the future of the Union and how this is going to affect the future of uh, uh, democracy, I'm reminded of a beautiful novel by Tal Calvino. It's called Baron in the Trees. And this tells the story of a young gentleman who was so dissatisfied 
with all the rules that his parents were trying to impose on him, that he jumped on the trees and all his life he basically spent never touching the earth again. He was living on the trees, he was eating there, he was falling in love there. I do believe if they're not going to be an attempt to politically empower the young generation of Europe, and this is not simply by, for example, reducing in some country uh, the voting age, but basically taking much more serious some of the issues that are shaping this generation, that are giving their political identities. If we are not going to do this, I'm very much afraid that we risk the young Europeans of today to jump on the trees. And having a generation on the trees is going to be really problematic for the way Europe is going to evolve as a political project. For me, the most important things about democracy is people never take place in a game if they don't believe that they can win in it. And from this point of view, having a young generation, which is very much having a different idea of history, which is very much preoccupied with the climate issue, which is very differently socialized than the way we are, Nevertheless, that we like or dislike many of their ideas, trying to marginalize them politically, in my view, is going to have a very high cost for the future of European Union. And this is where, basically, I want to end. Uh, because when you see the pandemic, and as I said, it was the demographic moment. Now we know, for example, what is a middle age. Middle age is the age in which you cannot feel kind of unscared by being infected, but at the same time, you cannot hope that you're going to be vaccinated early on. So in this type of a process, I do believe that we need type of European politics that will try to get and talk to this generation as a generation that has a very specific profile, that have a very specific experience of what it means to be European. This is not a united generation. Some of these uh, young people much more on the left, some are on the right. Some of them have an idea that, personally at least, I'm not particularly excited about. But the danger of marginalizing and excluding the young generation and young voters from European politics, in my view, is the most important thing. So I'm going to end up on something which is particularly trivial. And this is that when you talk about the future, be interested in those who are going to live in this future. And this is kind of a people who are now in their 15, 16, 18, 20 years old, uh, trying to understand their politics, trying to give them the way to win and lose, but in a serious political battle. In my view, this is probably the best that European Union can do for its future. Because nostalgia and the way to keep the world in the way it was can turn to be more dangerous for the future of Europe than the spread of the coronavirus. It is my feeling that the most important thing that Europe faces today is that we should learn again to date the future. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kraste, for this uh, insight in your thoughts. And uh, I have some questions from the, from the YouTube chat, from our audience, which we cannot see, but which is there. Uh, but before we start, I would like to come back to what you said about the it Italian restaurant. Uh, and it's interesting because we, and about ma majorities and minorities, because we are here in Brussels in a city where I heard one of its uh, mayors saying there are only minorities, there's no majority in the city. So it's an interesting place uh, to, to question the, the idea, the paradigm of the eth ethically um, homogeneous, uh, sorry, ethnically homogeneous nation state. So uh, coming back to, your, to the restaurant uh, and the idea that um, the food is Italian, um, we, in our first temporary exhibition, we actually deconstructed this kind of food, the pizza, and we, we tracked, traced back all the ingredients, which can actually be traced back across the world. So even, you could even question, uh, is the food Italian and uh, is it important whether it's Italian? Do, do we have to put this label? Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if you, we can take the first question from the audience. Uh, it is Anna Tilla watching from Brussels and she asks, with reference to the new law in Hungary, how can the EU communicate with the groups of citizens who do not share its fundamental values? 
Listen, this is, uh, uh, we're talking about the new, basically, legislation voted by the Hungarian government that basically criminalized anything that they're going to call uh, gay propaganda, uh, which is a legislation very similar and in a certain way stricter than the, the one that was basically adopted in uh, Putin's Russia some years ago. Paradoxically, uh, this legislation and basically the obsession with LGBT community in some of the governments in the region has a lot to do with the demographic problems I'm talking about. The fear of having no kids, the fear of a destruction of the traditional family, is something that is really becoming one of uh, the major political issue uh, in the politics of Europe in general, but particularly Central and Eastern Europe. And I do believe that, of course, you are seeing kind of a classical politics of exclusion, where the story is we talk about real Hungarians, real Poles, and these other people, they're not part of it. What European Union can do, this is a legal uh, problem. Basically, this is part of uh, uh, the European legislation, and I'm sure that on this level it is going to work. Secondly, this time I also believe that, unlike with certain other violations of some of European norms, uh, both the Polish and the Hungarian government probably can see a problem that uh, they have not been expecting to. Listen, when you go on the opinion polls and surveys, for example, about migration and its attitude some years ago, there was not a major generational difference. Uh, there was a very much kind of a critical view on the migration and acceptance of migrants in all countries of Central and Eastern Europe. It was not only Poland and Hungary. When it comes to sexual minorities, it's totally different depending how old you are. When I was talking about this generation that can jump on the trees, exactly, they have a different experience. This is not simply about values, it's not about books. They know a lot of their uh, friends. For them, this is kind of a lived reality. And secondly, when you are trying to weaponize this type of a cultural differences, you are facing the following problem. Traditionally, for example, Poland had a very conservative consensus on many issues, and it's easy to explain. And of course, uh, the role of the Catholic Church is not the only explanation. But now when the governments are weaponizing this for political, uh, 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 for political purposes, even some of the citizens, who probably are not so much uh, uh, in favor of demonstration of uh, gay and lesbian identities, they are not going to criticize them anymore because for them it's just to declare they support the government. So strangely enough, the liberalization of societies go like this. You are polarizing something to the extent that people who otherwise probably could be on your side of a cultural divide are going to change their cultural views. This was, by the way, the story with the abortion in the United States. In the beginning of the 1980s, the percent of uh, Republicans and Democrats, male, their view on abortion was basically equal. There was not major difference. The moment when basically it became a major political issue distinguishing between the two parties, now, for example, 80% of, uh, or 90% of the Democrats uh, are for and uh, quite a high percent of the Republicans are against. So I'm saying also because this type of a conflict is also changing society a lot. And this is not simply that probably Brussels is going to react and that European countries are going to react. What I do believe also Hungarian government is going to recognize is that for many of the Western companies functioning in Hungary, this is going to be a problem. Many of these companies were not particularly kind of agitated uh, when certain things happened on the field of media, or on the field of legislation. Uh, but now, because of their customers, uh, because of the countries from which they're coming from, I do believe you're going to see a much more backlash. So while I understand what is the electoral purpose of this legislation, I do believe that these governments are taking, taking a much higher risk than they understand. Thank you very much. We have here uh, two questions from a fellow Bul Bulgarian, uh, Boris, living in Brussels and having worked for 14 years as an environmental management consultant. He's asking, what opportunities for rethinking and re-evaluating our priorities as Europeans did the pandemic bring? And do we accept to be poorer, but perhaps adopt a more sustainable and sensible life? Are society and politicians ready to discuss this? Yeah, this is very, very, very fundamental questions. And I'll 
kind of uh, be unfair uh, uh, and insincere if I say that I know the answers. But uh, let's try to answer. Uh, uh, first, this crisis, the pandemic, was the second coming of the three previous crises that shattered Europe for the last 10 years. Uh, for example, if you see our debate now about the violation of individual rights, everything connected with the surveillance power of the governments, many of the things that came up as a result of the lockdowns, this is very much the repetition of the arguments and debates that we have during the war on terror debates. And we can see that there was a major change. When it comes to public health, of course people are ready to allow much more surveillance because it's not simply the fear that you can be affected, the fear that you can harm somebody else was also very central for this. If you go to the refugee crisis, you're also going to see a major change. First of all, all countries basically closed their borders on the same day. There was no difference between liberal Germany and illiberal Hungary. But also you're going to see that unlike in the migration crisis where everything was about ethnic origin, this time it was territorial. Non-citizens have been treated much more kinder and in much more inclusive way because you understand that you cannot just vaccinate your own citizens, you should vaccinate everybody who is on the territory of the country if you want to stop uh, the infection. And when it comes to the economic policies, basically what happened as a result of the pandemic is just the opposite to what happened after the global financial crisis. All the policies that were rejected back then have been adopted now. So from this point of view, there is a major change. And then comes the climate issue. And I do believe that at the heart of uh, uh, the question, and I do believe it's a very important question, on the surface, we have a consensus on climate. You are not going to see many people who are going to say climate is not a serious issue, sustainable life is not a serious issue. But one of the things that worries me is that we are trying to sell this as a win-win game, as if everything is going to be fine, nobody is going to lose. This is not true. We are going to lose. There are going to be higher prices of gasoline probably for a certain period of time. There are going to be a change of life. Uh, and while some people are eager to change their lives, probably others are not. And of course, in many countries, it's very different because new climate policies have a totally different meaning if you are IT specialist or if you're working in a coal mine in Bulgaria or in Poland. So what I'm afraid of is always the things that look very consensual on the surface can end up being very politically divisive. And climate is going to be one of it. And one of the biggest problems of climate is that nevertheless of what Europe is doing, we cannot save the earth on our own. It means that we should basically cooperate with everybody. So if we're the only one who are doing what we're doing, we're probably going to lose competitiveness and we're not going to save the world. Secondly, if we want others to cooperate, particularly countries like China and Russia, how we're going to treat their human rights policies, how we're going to treat things that we don't like in their political behavior. There is a certain talk in Europe, which I always find problematic, that all good things go together. They don't go together. They're tragical choices to be made, and different people are going to make it difficult. This is probably the legacies of 1990s. I'm never going to uh, forget. On uh, September 11, 2001, out of all places, I happened to be in a movie theater in Skopje, the capital of uh, uh, North Macedonia. And the film that was uh, in the movie was uh, a blockbuster called Air Force One. I'm not sure that because people who are listening to these lectures probably are not a great uh, lovers of uh, these popular movies, but this is a story of American president where terrorists hijacked his family. And he's in a classical Antigona dilemma. This is a classical ancient Greek drama. You should choose between saving your country and saving your family. And what did the president choose? He saved both. Uh, and I do believe from this point of view, there is this tendency also in European politics to believe that we can have all these things together. And this is why I'm afraid that uh, even the moment when we're going to talk about trade-offs and others, people are going to feel kind of a stuck because now there is a not clear conversation, not on a macro level, but on a way of life, how much things should change in order to have the environmental policies that, in theory, is supported by the majority of Europeans. 
You mentioned all the crises. I recently read a book where the, 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 it started with the question, when will we ever live in a moment where we don't say we are in crisis? So all the crises uh, that you mentioned since 2008. A follow-up question would be perhaps, do you think that, uh, so for example, the, you mentioned the rescue package and the, uh, putting together the, the, the depths um, uh, of the, of the country, Euro, European Union countries, do you think this will remain uh, after the pandemic? Or was this a moment in which it became possible, but afterwards uh, they will come back to, to as it was before? No, they're not going to come back. Uh, and for a very simple reason, which, by the way, is very much also based on the national interests. You see a certain deglobalization moment. You see the rise of protectionism in all major economies, including the United States. And I'm even not talking about China and other places. And suddenly, European companies understand that for them, European market is more important than ever before. So from this point of view, for Germany, it's very important that Italians are going to be prosperous enough to buy expensive German cars. Uh, and from this point of view, strangely enough, uh, this kind of a unification of Europe comes not so much from kind of a pro-globalization push, but is very much pushed by the process of deglobalization that we have seen around us. Because uh, reading uh, uh, some of the surveys that have been done, uh, uh, conducted by the European Council of Foreign Relations, I was struck to see that the thing that shocked Europeans most after the public health uh, uh, kind of a crisis itself is how lonely is Europe in the world? Mm -hmm. How different were others? How differently they react? And I do believe this creates the feeling, probably not community of values, but community of faith. Uh, we understand that in order to have any relevance in this global world, we should stay together. And this explains one interesting fact. Every previous crisis divided Europe on pro-Europeans and anti-Europeans. Uh, it was particularly clear during the global financial crisis where there was the north-south divide during the migration crisis where was west-east divide. Paradoxically, the idea that Europe should be more consolidated and even the recovery uh, package was also supported by many nationalistic voters which were going to be perceived as anti-European in the previous crisis because suddenly you realize that what it means to be protectionist on term of Bulgaria what is the national economy that we're going to protect? And I do believe this is the realization. We are in it, uh, at least particularly in economic terms, and particularly for the small and medium-sized countries. Europe is a reality. It is not a project. You cannot get out of the European Union. But what is worrying is that if you see this confidence uh, uh, pollings, the two countries in which, particularly after the delayed vaccination, we have the highest level of dissatisfaction with the performance of the Union at Germany and France. And this is what I have learned from studying this integration in other places. Don't get worried when periphery is getting wild. Get worried when the center starts to revolt. So from this point of view, the success of the recovery plan is going to be critically important, at least in my view, for the consolidation of the Union. So protectionism for you uh, moves to a level of the European Union rather than the nation state? Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Okay. Um, I have another question from uh, Katerina, working in the rule of law unit of the European Commission. And she's asking, what lessons should the EU institutions learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? So probably we should learn different lessons. One is that the capability of the state is of incredible importance. This is not simply what you want to do, but can you do it? The second is that the level of mistrust in modern societies is very high. In the beginning of the crisis, and I have this kind of at least expectations when I was writing Is It Tomorrow Yet, which was written very early on, it was May last year, that probably because of the public health nature of the crisis, we are going to have slightly more trust in experts because it's easier to trust doctors than financial experts. Listen, it appears that conspiracy theories are spreading faster uh, than <laughs> the coronavirus. And this is the result of many things, but the most important is that as citizens, we all the time should take positions about issues on which we do not have a personal experience. 
It is very difficult. Uh, there was a lot of studies showing that, for example, mistrust in the media is very much the result of the disappearance, for example, of the local newspapers in the United States. Mm -hmm. Because on the local newspapers, you know the people and you know how true or untrue certain story is. When you don't have this type of a mediator between you and the national level, then you're either trusting or mistrusting, and mistrusting is easier. Because mistrustful people, paradoxically, are never disappointed uh, because they're never hopeful, but on the other side, mistrustful people are very much disempowered. Because if you don't trust anybody, you cannot change anything. But you cannot be disappointed either. Yeah, yeah. so from this point of view, individually, psychologically, mm -hmm. uh, being a cynic and pessimist pays back. But if you want to produce any type of a social change, you need to trust, to trust people around you, to trust a government. Trusting the governments too much is not a good idea too, and I do believe our governments are giving us a good uh, reasons not to do it. So talking about particularly on the rule of law, it appears that people really care in the moment of crisis about the fairness of the system. And this is critically important because this was see very much with vaccinations. This was see with the access to the hospital. But also during the crisis, you see some of this dark side, particularly of the demographic reality that I was talking about. Listen, in country like Bulgaria, the average age of the medical personnel was above 50. Mm -hmm. Because you have such an incredible outmigration of the health workers, doctors, nurses from east to the west. I was reading some data for 2018. For example, uh, there was uh, 1,300 uh, people who graduated medicine in Hungary, but at the same year, 950 Hungarian doctors have left the country. If uh, European Union will not try to balance this, uh, then we are going to have a real problem, particularly in the Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm never going to forget one uh, old lady in one of the dying parts of the country who told me, listen, I like European Union, but they took my kids and my doctors away. And this type of also the new regional, not only on the level of the EU, but even on the nation state, if you see demographic projections in country like Bulgaria in 30 years, 69% of the territory of the country is what demographers define as demographic desert, which means less than 10 people live in a square kilometer. So concentration of people in a big cities and kind of a total depopulation of certain areas, I do believe this is a major problem. And in a certain way, the most important political divide in Europe is not between East and West. This is between the urban areas uh, and the depopulated countryside. From this point of view, Bratislava, Budapest, Warsaw, Prague are not seeing the world differently than many of the West European countries. They're also not uh, voting differently. Uh, but there is a big part of our countries where people are in a totally different position. You mentioned emigration uh, from Eastern Europe, and now we have a question related to migration, and it presumes that I presume that it's rather from outside of Africa. So it's a question from Hendrik Balleger. Uh, top economist Minouche Shafik said this, and I'm quoting: "Data shows that it is not the degree of migration that causes problems, but the pace. Yeah. Uh, and a society adapts if it goes slowly. What is your opinion on that?" Uh, there, there is a lot of data showing this. In a certain way, this is, and this is why from time to time I do believe we are unfair uh, to some of the fears of the people. There was a lot of studies being done, and this is one of the things that they, uh, I do believe also uh, the COVID-19 created. Listen, because of the COVID, because of the fact that every day you know how many people are infected, but you are going to see also the model, what is the prediction, how many are infected, how many are going to die in 10 days, in 30 days. People started to live with projections. And now you have these incredible projections, for example, now around 9 million uh, of these, uh, people living in Europe uh, of African origin. Uh, there was uh, uh, the French uh, uh, scholar uh, uh, who basically say in 30 years they're going to be 150. When you're going to see this type of figures, which can realize or not realize, people get scared because this is the disintegration of the world as they know it. And from this point of view, yes, it is the pace. And this explains why the regions in which the response and the reaction against the migration
comes most from the areas in which you have the lowest number of migrants. Nothing is more dangerous than the foreigner that you have never met. Uh, and from this point, but this is a real issue. It does not mean that people's fears should be simply neglected because in democratic politics, you cannot neglect the fears of the people. In the United States, uh, there was a survey being done in which you have a random group of white people. And one of them were given to read the report that according to the national census in 2042, the whites, in the way they are defined now, I mean without the Latino, are not going to be the majority in the United States anymore. So they're going to be like Belgium. And then basically, uh, you have others, the same profile, who didn't know this. Mm -hmm. It appeared that people that have been informed about these demographic projections became much more hostile to the minority groups. He had been much more kind of protective in uh, uh, their politics. So how we talk about the future is also how you're making the future. And this space argument, I am taking it very seriously. And this is true about any policy. People like to talk about revolution. People don't like to live in a revolution of any kind. You are talking of slow changes. And here there's a question about a mentality cha change from Simon. Do you think a more cosmopolitan union could help us to improve the EU? There was one of the paradoxes of the pandemics that I discovered. On one level, of course, the pandemic was a nationalist moment. When all this started, we all took and take uh, shelter in the borders of our nation states. Uh, and in the case, at least, of my family, even we went back to Bulgaria, out of Vienna, regardless of the fact that uh, the public health system in Austria is better because in the moment of crisis, the idea of cultural knowledge helps you. The language that you're hearing that you know from childhood, the fact that you know the geography differently, this gives you strange metaphysical sense of security that probably is not going to help you in medical terms, but very much helps you in psychological terms. But at the same time, this was a cosmopolitan moment because uh, we have been in the Bulgarian countryside and I see people who have never been much interested of anything that was happening outside of Bulgaria, which suddenly, every day, were trying to understand what is happening in Brazil, how many people are dying in the United States, why. There was a moment in which, for the first time probably, we all have been living in a common world. Mm -hmm. And this was not a kind of intellectual construct. This was a common collective experience. And because when I was seeing how your ex uh, exposition is organized, I find it very important that you are really pressing on this common experiences even when people basically experience them very differently. Mm -hmm. This is Europe. From this point of view, the pandemic was a collective experience. And part of this collective experience is much more cosmopolitan. Then we understand much more what it means to be European. Uh, we, by the way, start to see ourselves much more through the eyes of other peoples. Suddenly, and I do believe everybody realized it, uh, we start to look to ourselves in the way we had been seeing Asian tourists with all these masks on the airports. Uh, but listen, these small things are changing, talking about mentality of people. Mm. Suddenly you understand that this is different. And from my point of view, the climate is also important from this point of view, because climate is something which is very local. You're experiencing what is happening to nature in the places that you know best. But at the same time, this is things that affects everybody. And I do believe this kind of a... Uh, totally different dynamics uh, between local and cosmopolitan is critically important. And also the idea, I do believe people understood that in order to be cosmopolitan, you don't need to go to the airports every three days. That's one of the paradoxes yeah, you would describe. Yeah, exactly. It. Cosmopolitanism is a state of mind. Uh, Immanuel Kant, who basically in every book is going to come as the classical cosmopolitan, was famous that basically was making the same walk every day and didn't basically left uh, uh, his Königsberg. So from this point of view, this is a different idea of cosmopolitanism. And uh, in philosophy, we had this term of rooted cosmopolitanism. And I do believe that pandemic uh, gave me a hope that you have a lot of it. Cosmopolitans are not people who do not care about their own place. They are people who know that their own place is very much connected with other places in the world. 
have another question about uh, cosmopolitan and European identity uh, gaining track among young populations. So this is also a question that I wanted to ask you, actually. Do you think nostalgia is very much related to, to a certain generation? Um, how is the young generation related to that? And also, is it linked to certain uh, cultural affiliations? Because I remember Scandinavian journalists once told me that Scandinavians are not as nostalgic as the rest of Europe, and they look to the future, whereas uh, the others are stuck in the past. So do you think there's a, there's a, this nostalgia is, uh, is linked to certain types of uh, population, or is it a general phenomenon? Uh, in 2019, in the summer of 2019, um, there was, I do believe, Bertelsmann Foundation that had a big public survey on nostalgia in all European Union member states. And it turned out that in every single European member state, including the Scandinavians, the majority of the people believed that life was better before. So we're not going to agree when before, when basically I was reading uh, this survey, uh, Bulgarian fiction writer Georgi Gospodinov uh, wrote a book uh, which was very much about the future of Europe and in his book, because uh, European leaders cannot agree about the future, they decided to have a referendums in every single country in which decade of the 20th century you want to go back. Uh, and this was a very nice uh, book, and I was trying to see, okay, imagine that really they're going to be referendum, but not on the level of the nation states, but Europe as a whole. Which is the year in which the majorities of Europeans can agree to go back together? I mean, this year should be perceived as a good past in Warsaw and in Germany, uh, in uh, Sofia and in Stockholm. And this came to me because suddenly I realized that at the end of the day, 1989, with every criticism that we can come about it, was really the hour of Europe because everybody can imagine Europe in a different way. But this sense of the future, the future that Europe was the future of the world, was so strong. So. I don't believe even young people have been quite nostalgic uh, in these surveys. You can also see this in some of the protests, for example, if you see everything which is connected to economic issues. In 1968, quite often, young people go on the street, we don't want to live like our parents. In many of the uh, street protests, when it comes to economic issues in Europe, is young people going on the street and said, we want to live like our parents. We want to, have, to have a level of social security, I mean steady jobs and so on. So this is why for me the problem of how politically a generation that does not have the numbers easily to change politics and because of it very easily, many of these people who didn't vote are politically active. You're going to see them on the street. They're going to protest on the issues. They're going to be very active on social media. Social media yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to vote. And this is changing democracy. Listen, democracy is a place in which political regime, in which people believe that elections matter. If people don't see the political change through elections, obviously many things should change. Thank you. At the same time, there's, uh, there's no nostalgia, but at the same time, there's the fear of history repeating itself, which is here brought to us by Carolina, uh, who asks, um, you said Yugoslavia is being thought of as an example of the past, but maybe that is wrong. Are you afraid the history might repeat itself? Listen, I do believe, and this comes from George Steiner, he believes that in a certain way, Europeans has enough history in order to know that being afraid is never a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it is another bad idea because also what comes, in my view, with our collective experience of COVID-19 is that, first, nothing should be taken for granted. And many things that we believe that can never happen again can happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is really what we're learning. But what is important for me, and uh, today I was saw that in your exhibition you have this quote from Tony Judd, uh, who I was lucky to know, he had one point that always comes to me in the way when we talk about history, political, but also in intellectual terms. Tony Judd at the end was quite critical to the way Europeans have been teaching history after the end of the Cold War. And his major uh, uh, concern was the following. He said, we are teaching the lessons of history. We are not teaching history. Because history is to try to imagine the life of different people, to get in their shoes, 
to try to imagine the choices that uh, they were trying to make. And for me, this is critically important because one of the things that struck me with the youngest generation, both here and in the United States, is that they try to treat all historical figures as their contemporaries. So in a certain way, it is, doesn't matter for good or for bad, but this is a very idea that all history is here. It's present. It's present. And uh, I don't believe it. In a certain way, things, as the famous saying goes, history does not repeat, but it rhymes. Uh, and this is why uh, there are two risks that we have. One is to see everything as repetition. Basically, not every illiberal regime that we don't like is a fascist regime. But the other is to believe that all these negative developments, that, for example, fascism is never possible. Uh, no, this is also not true. So how to balance between this? So I'm worried. The most important thing these days is not to be worried and not worried, but first, how worried you are, and secondly, to be worried for the right reason. <laughs> if you can bear with us for five more minutes, I'll take yeah. the last questions. Uh, so there's a great question, actually, about the minority you were talking about, the, the, young, the young people. Uh, from Owen Brown, and, and he asks about uh, lowering the voting age. Uh, you talk about lowering the voting age not being enough. Do you think there could be any, any benefit in giving parents the right to vote on behalf of their children? So this is a critically interesting question, because one of the things that is going to happen, and I was thinking a lot about how one of the body politics, of, for example, Bulgaria can look like in 20, 25 years. Probably there are going to be 20, 25 percent of people who, if we follow the policy that we have today, are going to be foreigners working on the Bulgarian market. They can come from other European states, they can come from Ukraine, from Moldova, probably from Africa, I don't know from where, but because you have a labor shortage, you're going to have this. These people are going to have social rights, but they're not going to vote in the way I'm not voting for the mayor of Vienna, nevertheless, that we're living there for 10, uh, 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 for, uh, for 10 years. Uh, then basically you're going to have 40% probably of the voters who are going to be on retirement age because of the aging of the population. And then you're going to have 10, 15, probably 20% of the voters living outside of the country. So they can vote on the tax laws, but they're not going to pay the taxes in the countries. How to balance this body politics? And from this point of view, for me, this is the major story. And here, strangely enough, European Union make it easier to have this kind of a strange conglomeration. Because when I'm saying that I'm not voting uh, in Vienna, I'm not deprived of political rights. I can vote on the Bulgarian elections. I can vote on the level of uh, 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 district of Vienna, but in a certain way, you're not voting on the elections that are most important for you. You're not voting where you're paying taxes. And this divorce between paying taxes and voting, which was so important for the emergence of democracy, is coming again and again. So yes, it is not, uh, and allowing parents to vote, this is quite interesting. Because let's give you an example outside of Europe. 40% of the South Koreans today of a certain age, basically are not marrying and do not have children. This is the other story. What is the time horizon? How the fact that basically I have or I don't have uh, kids is going to affect my political behavior, how I see the future. Normally, basically, we see the future through our kids. And this is a different lifestyle. I don't see any wrong with the way people are making decisions how to have their life, but is this going to have? Uh, political consequences when it comes to long-term policies. Uh, so in a situation like this, I don't believe that there is a universal response what should be done, but in my view, acknowledging the fact that the small cohort of the young people is distorting the way democratic politics works in Europe, in my view, is critically important. Yes, I think we are many people in Brussels also who have been living here for 10, 20 years and are still voting for our previous yeah. home country and not the federal government. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of things to improve here. Um, I'll, I'll give you the t two last questions together um, and then we will close. So the, um, uh, t one is from Liliana and she's asking, does internal EU policy influence the external image of the EU? And then the very last question, and this is related to um, what's happening here in Brussels. Uh, Willem van der Geest, who is asking, what can you expect from the conference on the future of Europe? Uh, so, 
listen, what was happening in Europe affects the way others see it. Uh, in a certain way, this is true not only for Europeans, but normally uh, we try to believe that others see us necessarily in a very positive way. But there is a well-known study from the University of Michigan from years ago where somebody was asked how he looks in the eyes of his six best friends. And then the six best friends have been asked about their view on the person, and it appeared that the only people that have a quite relevant view how they view by their friends are people who have a maniacal, maniac fear of being underestimated and persecuted. We are never looking as good in the eyes of others in the way we look in our own eyes. Uh, nevertheless, that we can say that basically 50% of the vaccines that have been produced in European Union were allowed to travel abroad, something that didn't happen in the United States. It's very difficult to explain, for example, to the North Macedonians why it was so difficult for the European Union to fight the vaccines, at least uh, for their medical uh, personnel. Uh, and all of these things, the idea of Europe being much more selfish than we're ready to recognize is there. There is a history of Europe which is positive on one level and totally seen differently in other parts of the world. I do believe we should start to be much more interested and be slightly more realistic how we are seen from outside. And this very much goes to the idea of the future of Europe conference. Listen, there are two scenarios. And one, it can turn to be a kind of a Brussels versus of political yoga in which everybody mediates for itself. The other is pushing a conversation in which, for example, it's going to be easier for all of us to understand that probably we have more common concerns, that these concerns are articulated differently and experienced differently in different parts of Europe. And we can try to use this talk not simply to do things differently, but also, to be honest, to justify policies differently. Because this is one of the things that I have learned from the political science books. Policy is not simply what the government is doing, but also the language on which it is justifying certain policies. One and the same act being justified differently is a different policy. So from time to time, even when uh, we have policies coming from Brussels, which basically many people are going to agree, the language on which they are justified uh, is very much alienating people. So this is an opportunity. But listen, like every opportunity, it can easily be missed. So we don't know yet. We don't know yet. <laughs> so, so you are making a plea for a critical look at uh, Europe, a yeah. critical look at the past. Uh, but also, I think sometimes we are surprised how uh, we are also, the European Union can also be per perceived uh, positively. But we will ask this question to our future invitees. So I would also already like to invite the audience uh, to follow the lecture series, which will go for, on for a year during the conference on the future of Europe. And I hope that the young generation that you mentioned will also participate actively in all the debates that are happening about the future so that uh, the young generation will contribute to shaping the future. So I would like to thank you very much for your eye-opening perspectives. And I hope to see you uh, again soon here in Brussels. Thank you very much. And to be honest, it was very wise to start with me because every other speaker probably is going to be not simply better, but probably even more optimistic. So you are going to see a progress. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. Thank you.